Cashflow Diary Podcast, Episode 487. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. The podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leverage streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's cash flow game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you are here today because here's the thing. When you are out there, you you have an idea, right? And, and you get started, you're very excited, and at the end of the day, you're like, man, this is going to be excellent. It's going to the moon, right? I, I'm going to have so much fun building my business. That's what we are thinking. We're entrepreneurs. We're naturally positive. That's kind of what happens. And then we often encounter resistance. <laughs> sometimes that resistance comes in many different forms. And, and sometimes we can be the actual source of resistance. And we have lost track of the fact that we are actually pursuing a long-term goal. And understanding this is important. But most importantly, we'll often ask ourselves this very important question. Do I have what it takes? Can I make it? How long is it going to take before I arrive? And we're trying to figure out these things as we are building our business. Now, let me ask you this question. What would you call that? Some people say, well, these hard times, they develop your character. Others say you just don't have enough perseverance or grit to make it happen. I have with me today someone who literally studies character development, self-control, grit. She is the founder of Character Labs. You may know her from her TED Talk. I have with me, of course, Angela Duckworth. Now, what I'm excited about is the fact that when we are talking about do we have what it takes to make it, we actually have a person who can tell us scientifically how to not only make sure that we have it, but our kids, and more importantly, we go out there and make something happen. Now, here's the thing, guys. We got to pay attention because we, we a professor from the University of Pennsylvania is about to share with you and I exactly what's it going to take. If you've always wanted to know, well, now we're going to find out. So let's get ready to listen, learn, and love Angela Duckworth. Angela, how are you doing? I'm good, Jay. How are you? So far, I'm really excited because the, the simple fact that you study something that seems unstudiable... <laughs> <laughs> is kind of exciting to me. It's like, how do you quantify that? And, and that's definitely one of many questions I have for you. But before we go there, um, this being the first time that you're here, I have to ask you the same question I tend to ask everybody else. Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. You know, Batman, Robin, Wonder Woman, etc. And I think... Superheroes and entrepreneurs have a ton of things in common, chief among them that as a, a superhero or as an entrepreneur, I can occasionally imagine myself flying around town, you know, uh, using our products and services and saving our customers. And maybe I am wearing a cape or a tight, you know, it's a big deal. But at the same time, just like a superhero, an entrepreneur has a beginning. You know, if you think about Spider-Man, for example, there was a time where he was just a kid going to school, doing his thing, taking some photos, trying to earn some pizza money. That was it. And then one day something happens to him. He gets bit by a spider, discovers he's got special abilities and gets to choose whether to use them for good or for evil. So my question to you is as follows. Before Character Lab, before your book, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance, before the TED Talk, before being a, a professor 
of psychology at the University of Pennsylvania. Before all of these things, what we want to know is, who is Angela Duckworth? I love that question. Um, well, going all the way back to the beginning, I was this little girl, grew up in Cherry Hill, New Jersey. Hmm. And for those people who know New Jersey, it's by exit four. And um, <laughs> went to public schools. You know, I don't think anybody thought I was going to be special when I grew up. I didn't hear that from my parents. My dad had very high standards and uh, literally said out loud, you know, you're no genius, um, which he, by the way, also said to my brother and sister. Grew up and I became a teacher, actually. I taught math to kids in the public schools in New York City and in San Francisco, finally ended up teaching in Philadelphia. And I think that combination of having a dad who was always wondering about, you know, how successful he was and his kids and did they measure up and how smart were they and then becoming a teacher where that was my job, right, to bring out the best in my young my young students. I think all of that made me so fascinated, so puzzled really by success and motivation and, and who really does get ahead and who ends up falling behind. And for me, one of the most important things when I shifted my life to become a psychologist was to to realize that, you know, we all our lives, you know, have some idea of, you know, how gifted or talented we are or aren't. And, you know, that ends up being a preoccupation for a lot of people. But what my research says is that a lot of what you do in life is your passion and your perseverance. And that's not talent. That's grit. Interesting. Okay. So here's the thing. There's this constant question in, in the world of, are entrepreneurs born or are they made? What would you say? I would say mostly made, but you'll notice that I qualified that a little yes, bit. Yes, you I, did. I, I do want to, right? <laughs> I mean, look, you know, you've got DNA in you, right? Half from your mom, half from your dad. I've got the same, right? DNA from my mom or dad. And there are these tendencies that we are born with, you know, to be a little louder, a little quieter, you know, to be a little more thrill seeking, a little more cautious, you know, entrepreneurs are people. So they have DNA from their mom and their dad, and that will influence, they'll tilt things in a certain way. So I don't want to deny that, you know, we have something in us that is born and there are tendencies, you know, anybody who has a brother or sister can, you know, see that they have, you know, the same exact house, the same exact, you know, breakfast, but, you know, some of those differences that are really, striking to you, well, those are because you didn't inherit all the same genes as your brother or sister did. So yeah, there's part of being an entrepreneur that is an inborn tendency, but but I'm really interested in the part that um, is about being made, made by your experiences, made by your mentors, made by decisions that you, you know, maybe carried out for good or for bad, but you learned something. I think there's a lot to be said about what you do after, you know, you get handed those cards from your mom and dad. And I think that's the part that um, really successful people focus on, not what they can't change, but what they can. Indeed, indeed. Now, I, I'm I'm so excited. I, I, I skipped so much <laughs> right there. Like, did you just wake up one day and go, you know what, I want to study perseverance, grit, character. Like, how, how does that, how did you even come to this? Yeah, that's what I want to do. I, I, I don't, like, there's got to be a journey there. I don't know if you've ever sat down, you know, with a kid or, or frankly with a, you know, millennial or, you know, someone else that you're, you're sitting down with them and you know that they can do something and you're just urging them to keep trying. I mean, maybe they're screwing up, they're getting a math problem wrong, or, you know, maybe you're coaching a, you know, young entrepreneur and they, you know, they, they, they do a terrible first pitch to a, you know, to a VC you know, you know, because you have more experience that, that you can see around the corner, you know, that it's going to take a lot of tries, but they're going to learn eventually it's going to be fine. I think what got me starting down this path of studying grit is that when I sat down next to kids and they would give up after, you know, the first or second try, but I could see around the corner and I wanted them to keep going. I wanted them to be persistent, but they weren't that, I don't know, that frustration of mine as a teacher trying to get people to do what I knew they could do eventually to be the people I knew they could become, I think that my frustration and you know, not always being able to bring that out actually led me to study grit. Interesting. So you were frustrated because they, they would quit. 
Yeah, I was really frustrated because they were they were quitting earlier than I than I you know thought you know obviously you want to quit something after you know maybe try it a hundred times and like you know maybe it's just never going to happen, but you know so many people give up too early, and that frustrated me as a teacher. Um, and I thought you know what to really get people to be their best, you have to understand their choices. You have to understand where they are now before you try to get them where you're trying to bring them. And that led me to psychology because that's what psychology is, a study of human nature. Interesting. So how do you know if you just quit versus didn't have enough grit? <laughs> I mean, you know, knowing when to fold and knowing yeah. when to hold them, uh, like, like the old country music Yeah, that's song. exactly right. Um, right? Um it's it's never easy, so I don't want to be um, glib about it, right? It's never easy. I, I, you know, I struggle with that. You know, I'm working on a project. It's my seventh year working on a project sometimes, and I'm like, well, maybe this is me being stupid, right? Um, uh, but, but I would say this. If you have, like, a top-level goal, and the people that I study who are really successful, I mean, they can often articulate, like, what their life is about, even in a sentence of, frankly, a short sentence, like 10 words or fewer, for me, it's use psychological science to help kids thrive. I mean, I'm going to be really stubborn about that goal. There's nothing that would keep me from, you know, taking breaths till my last day to work on that goal. But maybe there's a project that's not working out, and I'm like, you know what? Eventually, I'm going to give up on it. But what I don't give up is the end state. You know, what I'm really working toward is that ultimate goal. So I think if you're asking yourself, should I give up or should I not give up, one way to think about it is, you know, is this like a deep personal value or is this simply a means to an end? Because if it's a means to an end, you know, maybe you can find another means to the same end. Interesting. So what would you say has been, all right, in the, in the time that you have studied this, what would you say has been like the most surprising finding? When I went to study the cadets at West Point, these are those, hmm. you know, 18-year-old women and men, they get the congressional recommendation, they're often, you know, valedictorians, they're almost always varsity athletes, and they're um, very often, you know, varsity athlete captains. I mean, they're, they're fine specimens. Uh, when they get to West Point, they uh, have a training that's called beast barracks, because it's, it's that hard. You wake up at 5, you go to 10, nonstop. Uh, and there's no cell phones, you know, there's no contact with your parents. It's really hard. The most surprising thing that I found in my research at that point in my career was that the measure that I had of their grit, you know, their self-reported passion and perseverance, you know, setbacks don't discourage me, staying committed to goals over years, that ended up not only predicting who would get out of training, it was pretty much unrelated to measures of their talent like their SAT score or, you know, how fast you can run two miles. And so that idea, I think, has really driven a lot of my work, that, that talent and your ability to persist and overcome uh, and to stay true to some goal that's very important to you, that, that to me is profound because for a lot of us, you know, who maybe didn't get into the gifted and talented program when we were in elementary school or, you know, weren't singled out as being the one who was gifted on the athletic field, you know, it says there's something that we can do here that's different from our, our innate talent. Whoa, whoa, okay, all right. It One could interpret or extrapolate from what you're saying that the you're saying that the talented people are at a disadvantage in this area. Well, I found mostly that it was unrelated to their grit. So it doesn't mean that they're, if you know, if people are a really smart, talented person, doesn't mean they're going to be low in grit, but there's no guarantee of grit. Some companies feel like, look, we're going to hire kids who are whiz kids because they'll also be hardworking and passionate. And that's not true. You, you, you may yeah. get some, you may get lucky, but you may not. Got it. Now I understand. Now I understand. Okay. Because I, I mean, I mean, hopefully you can understand where I'm coming from. It, it feels so random. Uh, you know, like when I, if I'm out there trying to bring someone on onto the team, I, will they persevere through whatever they've got to learn in order to actually get the job done? Can they make the objective work? And having grown up in a in a military uh, household in my head, the only thing that matters is the mission. <laughs> it's like this is the mission. You you keep persevering until it's done. Why are you stopping? And it's challenging for me to relate 
to other individuals who don't see the world that same way. So in your time working with, you know, this concept and individuals, for those of us that are, you know, leading organizations or building our company, how, how do we learn to either A, develop that grit inside of, of our organization for the people? Or how do we, how can we better relate to those who might not have it? It is hard, isn't it? I have the same problem of, you know, <laughs> empathizing with people who, you know, want to, want to go home at five, want to roll in at nine, you know, never want to think about things on the weekend. It's really hard for me. I, I don't really fully understand, you know, that way of life, but it's, obviously it's, it's not immoral or anything. It's just, it is different. Um, I would say that if you're trying to build a culture in your organization, your company of grit, it all starts with modeling. In other words, you are setting an example for everyone around you. I mean, we all set examples for each other. Everybody's a leader in that sense. But I do think that the owner or the, you know, the entrepreneur at the top, I mean, you're in the spotlight all the time. And people will notice, you know, how you talk to other people, you know, they'll, they'll notice how you talk to the mailman when they drop off the mail. I think that there's an opportunity and a responsibility there then to model passion and perseverance. And let me get a little more specific than that. So, for example, with passion, I mean, I think it's a great thing to show people that you love what you do. And you were thinking about something on the weekend, heard a podcast that really, you know, inspired you, relates to the mission of the company you know, don't be shy, share, share that passion, you know, set it as a norm for the company that people think about these questions that are, you know, beyond the nine to five routine and, and they maybe occur to you in the shower or while you're making your coffee. That passion is something you can model. And at the same time, you can model perseverance. That doesn't mean being invincible. I think the number one mistake that um, mm-hmm. leaders often make is they feel like they need to show strength all the time. I think actually it's much more powerful to be vulnerable and to say, you know what, that was a really tough week. And, um, you know, I was really discouraged, comma, but, you know, what we learned from it was. Mm -hmm. And then people will have the license to, you know, also have some doubts, but then to get up again. Yeah, Uh, there's there's that um, thought process that I'm not allowed to be down, uh, so to speak, but I have found that that's where some of the greatest strength lies in order to keep persevering is recognizing and giving that that emotion some space so uh, i'm i'm curious with this information and knowledge and research that you have done what 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 on earth inspired you to want to write a book about it (laughs) like why write grit why did you <laughs> inspiration is one way that I mean, my husband just kept nagging me enough that I relented. And, you know, his argument was um, that if I didn't write a book about my research and somebody else was going to, and you know, do a really crappy job of it. And that would be annoying to me. And he was right. That was the, that was the <laughs> argument that finally convinced me. I'm sure that's actually what gets a lot of entrepreneurs off the couch too. You know, like it's just something annoys you and you're like, Oh wait, I'm going to fix that problem. Anyway, I wrote the book in, in part because my husband really, uh, you know, got me to it. And um, it was the hardest thing I ever did. I cried, you know, most days when I was writing it, I think. Um, I mean, it was so, so hard. I have a lot of empathy for people who they struggle and they, they uh, you know, wonder how the hell they got themselves into this mess. And I, you know, probably would have quit if my husband hadn't, um, I don't know, like scraped me off the floor, put me back together again, got me a cup of coffee. I think one of the things that has surprised me about really gritty people, and I'm talking about, you know, everyone, including like, you know, 300 pound football players, um, they have somebody in their life who, who believes in them. And um, Mm -hmm. part of grit is not in you, but you know, the people who love you. Well, and you, you're, you're actually bringing up two things that I want to talk about. One, um, I have found at least for myself, this to be very true. If I am, experiencing extreme negative emotion or I'm mad at like I'm mad at something or you someone ticks me off for whatever reason I suddenly have all kinds of ability to see that task to the end if I believe it's going to shut them up for example what I mean is when I first got started in real estate everyone told me what I couldn't do. They said, yeah, hey, you have a credit score of 398. You can't buy a house. They said you have, I mean, you're squatting a bank on property. You can't buy a house. You, you, you can't do these things. And then I went and did it. 
Uh, and then they said, well, you got lucky. And then I did it again. And then I said, you can't do it with an apartment building. So I did it again. Again, because I was mad at that, I was able to sustain the effort to get to the end goal. That's one thing. The other thing that's on my mind is um, what happens when that that outside stimulus goes away, that same perseverance or grit or whatever seems to also disappear. I'm curious as to your thoughts. Hello there, entrepreneur. This is Jay Massey. I know that if you've ever gone over to the site, cashflowdiary.com, you may have asked yourself, where on earth do you get a domain name from? Especially as you are beginning to build your bigger, better, better business, you need a web presence. You need the email address. You need a way for people to contact you electronically so that you can stop doing the at gmail.com game. Well, the good folks over at GoDaddy have definitely supplied us with every domain that we have ever used. So what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygodaddy.com forward slash cashflow diary. Again, that's trygodaddy.com forward slash cashflow diary because it's a quick way for you to get set up to capture your domain name the exact way that you want it. They got easy search functions. And most importantly for you is that you'll be up and running today. As I said, once you get started, stay started. Don't let small little obstacles of how to get your own domain name going stop you. So again, go to trygodaddy.com forward slash cashflow diary. And let's get back to the rest of the story. So this is what I call the I'll show you response to challenge. I have it too, by the way. People tell me, uh, <laughs> even when I was writing this book, I was walking down the street with a, a friend of mine who's you know, a very successful writer and psychologist. He wrote a book too. And I said, oh, you know, your book is great. You know, what was it like being on the bestseller list? And he said, oh, you know, your book's not going to be a bestseller. My oh. book is never on the bestseller list. You can't do that. I said, why not? And he said, you know, we don't write as well as those people who are on the best list. I got to tell you, it was like a fire in my belly. Mm. <laughs> I walked right home and I was like, I'm going to write a bestseller. I think that I'll show you response is um, very much in the mindset of, of people who, uh, you know, have, I think, you know, a drive um, and a drive to succeed. Now, the question is, what happens when you do succeed, right? What right. happens when you do, you know, achieve that goal and prove people wrong? Now, what's interesting about your story is it sounds like you then were looking for the next challenge, and I'm sure it fueled you for them to say, oh, yeah, you can't do it with a part building. You were just lucky that one time. I think that the people who can continually kind of approach life as if they're an underdog, even when they are the top dog, I mean, that, that is you know, what I find as a kind of signature of people who stay excellent instead of getting complacent. Yeah, I totally Totally agreed. Um, um, <laughs> seeking the next challenge is that that's that that is definitely my world. Uh, we we've now moved over into the short term rental space, and there's a lot of challenges there that we are tackling, which is which I think is great. Now, the other thing that you mentioned was um, environment. Like, can someone have this grit if if they're alone? Does it absolutely do, does someone external who, as you said, believes in them or that mentor that, you know, believes more of you than you believe of you. Is that is that required? I haven't yet met the exception. I mean, I am guessing maybe somewhere in the world there's someone who, you know, really didn't need anyone. I don't know if you ever heard about uh, Roger Bannister. He's yeah. the first person to break the four minute mile. Right mm -hmm. now, he wrote a book about it and he claims to have basically coached himself right? Like didn't really need anyone figured out how to do like interval training before there was interval training. And, you know, I then did some research into Roger Bannister's life and he actually did have a coach, at least for parts of his training. And the guy was named Franz Stoutful. And like, that was the guy really who like figured out that like interval training, uh, you know, was really more efficient. So I'm guessing that behind almost every high performer, there is somebody who, you know, gave that person advice or encouragement you know, maybe it was different people at different points of life. Um, and I definitely think it's the rule. And if people say like, oh, what about this person that, you know, I, I still think those are exceptions. Got it. So the concept in your in your world of the self-made woman doesn't exist. No, I don't really believe in completely self-made women or men. Yeah. OK, good. 
good uh, because that that's kind of where I was coming from. <laughs> I'm like, I don't know. Is that, is that your experience? I'm it, wondering what you, you yeah, it's a lot. been one. I mean, I'm an amalgamation of so many different people, input books, and in this case, and because of what I, I get the privilege, although. You know, for for those of you listening, I enjoy the fact that you're learning, but I get the privilege of interacting with all of these entrepreneurs, too. So, you know, I, I take from from the lessons that 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 everyone has. And, and, and I guess, you know, when you take the time to put it in a book, you know, that that makes sense, because I know for me, when I was going through my own book, it was it required grit. It, there were so many days I'm like, I don't want to. Why am I doing this? In fact, I can yeah. underscore it by saying I originally was going to do my audiobook like I was going to to be the voice. I did like the 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 introduction and I'm like, uh-uh, there is no way I can persevere <laughs> through this. And I went and found somebody else whose voice was close to mine. I'm like, you get the privilege of doing that cuz I can't do it. I just quit, I tapped out. And that's just where it is. Um so here's a question on that how can there's there's probably an entrepreneur or two who's listening right now who actually should quit something that they're doing but they're feeling they don't want to feel like a quitter they don't want to give up so to speak what would you say to them how can they figure out that yeah that what they've been pursuing it the, what they're actually receiving is feedback that the marketplace is saying you know what you should change uh your your direction the best piece of advice i could give is that what you need to make a really tough decision especially when you feel like your your ego and your feelings are getting in the way of making a rational decision is to take a third person perspective in other words, mm-hmm. you have to not approach the problem like what I should do, mm-hmm. but you have to pretend to be somebody else and somebody else who has your best interest at heart, but isn't all wrapped up with, you know, ego and emotion. You know, what would that trusted advisor recommend to you mm-hmm. to do in that situation? And by the way, maybe you just really do have an advice. And for many people, you know, it's a spouse, you know, it's your husband or your wife, or, you know, it's a former business colleague. It could be a partner. Um, but I think somebody who's just not you, who can get out of your skin, is actually, you know, you, you really want to weigh that perspective heavily. Now, if you reflect on that and you, you say, well, you know, if I had a trusted friend, if my best friend would tell me to get out of this, then maybe you should listen to that. Understood. Understood. Uh, the So you, you mentioned earlier that, you know, you, you were a teacher, you were working with kids, et cetera. And but at, yet at the same time, you say that entrepreneurs are mostly made. That was a qualified statement. Very true. Mm-hmm. So is there anything that uh, from a, a nurture standpoint that a parent can do to like, I, obviously, I'm an entrepreneur. My my wife is historically uh, she was or I say classically trained, so to speak. She went to school. She was the uh, she's got multiple degrees and comes from that kind of a family. I'm the college dropout thing Mm -hmm. and which makes an interesting household but at the same time if you're in that entrepreneurial world and you want your kids to gain that what what are some of the ways that we can help them do that you know i think it's a real challenge when you've fought an uphill battle in your life and then you know you have kids and you've, you've worked really hard to make an easy life for them but then you realize like wait a second you know right. i also want my kids to have a work ethic <laughs> like you know resilience so um so i i think that kids are best off when they are challenged and supportive um, and for people who are privileged um, because they've worked very hard and then they have kids, the challenge part ends up being, you know, pretty hard to pull off because, you know, they've gotten like, you know, I think about my own kids, like they've got their Whole Foods raspberries, you know, freshly washed on the table and then, you know, somebody washes their laundry. I mean, that's ridiculous. So do a hard thing yourself and have a family rule that everybody has to do a hard thing. Some kids might have it be a a paid job. Um, Other kids might make it um, a sport. But I think that hard thing should be challenging. It should require them to try to improve in a skill, get feedback, get negative feedback sometimes. Um, Something where, like, they're not allowed to quit in the middle, right? You're not allowed to quit in the middle of the season. Can't quit your job if you promised your boss that you were going to work through to the end of June. Mm -hmm. I think a hard thing assigned to, like, literally every family member, mom and dad, no exception, 
is a good you know way for kids to grow up. And I would say, you know, that can start pretty young, actually. Um, and as long as a kid has some choice in that hard thing, in other words, you know, they get a choice between baseball and swimming and violin or whatever, then, um, you know, they will start to learn responsibility. Yeah. Well, well I was thinking I, I have four kids, one of them. <laughs> She hasn't met a hard thing yet. She she is all about give me the neck, and I'm like you are just like your dad. This is gonna be a problem. <laughs> she's like, I'll take that challenge. What's next? What you got? Yeah, I mean, she can. How old is she? Uh, she is ten. She is ten. Awesome. And if you ever, I mean, you don't understand. It's down to who can put their seatbelt on first in the car, and it's like it's a thing <laughs> all the time. And I'm just like, wow. All right. Well, we got to channel that and work with that. And and I'm waiting for the time where she runs into something that actually does give her a challenge. Because, man, when that does yeah. happen, it's going to be an eye opening experience for all of us. But this this leads me to um, your work over at at Character Lab. Tell us about the genesis of that. What is it? And and. And why, again, <laughs> why do it? I mean, you, you've you got a book. You got yeah. the, the, your teaching. I'm just like, okay, she's just yeah, going to do everything. Yeah, why is that a nonprofit? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, I, okay. I, I had enough things going on. I got two kids at home. That's not that's not like having four kids at home, but it feels like a lot. Uh, I met a couple of educators um, just after I finished my PhD, and this is now more than a decade ago. And these educators are named Dominic and Dave. And they said, you know, we need to really um, help parents and teachers use science to help their kids develop things like grit and self-control and curiosity and you know, emotional intelligence. They, they said, let's let's call it Character Lab. And I said, um, I said, sure, let let's do that. And and that's really what it is. It's a it's a nonprofit. We're based in Philadelphia, but we have a website, characterlab.org. And we take science on things like grit and we turn it into actionable advice for parents and teachers. And everything is uh, supported by foundations and individuals. So it's all free. Now, you you say it's for parents and teachers, but I'm listening. I mean, I'm just listening to you going, well, maybe it'll work for me, too. <laughs> <You know? laughs> That's the great thing about character, right? I mean, you know, if you're helping your daughter with her algebra, you're like, okay, well, I had to help her with my algebra, but now I'm going to go back to my, my, my email and my work. But when you're helping your daughter learn how to set a goal and make a plan, you're helping your daughter, you know, identify and develop her passion. You're helping your daughter, you know, figure out, you know, what are ways that we can be socially intelligent in situations um, that are, you know, full of conflict. Look, those are things that your daughter needs. Those are things that you need too. And I, I love that about character. I think character development is for people of every age. Yeah. And so what are some of the things that you guys actually do over uh, at, at Character Lab? Like, give us an example. Here's one. And I bet a lot of your listeners are familiar with it. You ever hear of the 10,000 hour rule? Yes. Absolutely. That it takes 10,000 yes. hours of practice, right? right. To get your... So there is a scientist behind that you know, famous phrase, and his name is Anders Ericsson. And he studies Olympic athletes, and he studies, you know, world-class mathematicians. He studies experts. And uh, what he has developed with us, based on his decades of research on experts, is, you know, a quick way of learning how experts practice and how to apply that kind of expert practice to anything you do, whether you're trying to be, you know, a better tennis player, um, a, you know, a better student. And so we've developed a playbook on practice and, you know, you can go to our website. We had the, um, we had the video for it narrated by an expert, uh, Wynton Marsalis, um, who, you know, immediately saw how this applied to his own life as a jazz musician. Um, and then, you know, there are worksheets and, you know, um, we tried to write everything based on science, but without any scientific jargon. So that's an example of, you know, what, what we do, you know, it's a lab for developing character and, it's all based on research, but it's also, I think, accessible to, to to anyone who just cares about kids. Interesting. Got it. And so what have there been, I guess, parents who have come to you? Like, can you help me? That type of thing. <laughs> 
I get a lot of parents who ask me to help them individually. And unfortunately, I don't have a lot of time, you know, to give advice, you know, one on one. Um, but yeah, we have heard that, um, you know, having these resources and, and knowing that they are based on science. I mean, there is a lot of advice out there on the Internet and in the world. But, you know, if you want to know what's based on evidence, what's based on, you know, more than just like your grandmother's, you know, wisdom, then I think this is really helpful. Hey, grandma knew some stuff, though. Yeah, not yeah. Grandmas are probably right, but you know we should test some of their grandma's <laughs> hypotheses if they hold up. Yeah, yeah, no, I understand. They don't all hold up. <laughs> you know, my grandmother thought like if I cut my nails really short, then I would grow up really tall. I'm like you know that that wasn't actually you know that was a good hypothesis, grandma. <laughs> that, that that turns out not to be true. And I see. I, yeah, that there's very little <laughs> data to back that one up. Totally understood. Totally understood. <laughs> so for those that have listened this far and want to find out more about what you guys are up to. What's going to be the best way for them to track you down? Well, if you're a parent or a teacher, I'd love you to visit uh, characterlab.org. And if you're not and you just want to learn about grit and, you know, get the grit scale and all that, you can go to AngelaDuckworth.com. And I put all the insight that I have into my book on grit, and I called it Grit, the Power of Passion and Perseverance. Excellent. Now, uh, I have a final question for you, and I, I got to gotta be transparent here. I am beyond excited to ask it of you because I I'm like you this is I'm expecting the most unique answer that I have ever gotten out of the hundreds <laughs> no, no of pressure I feel none I, I actually I feel none. <laughs> of course you're asking the question <laughs> yeah, I know I know I'm I know, answering I know. the question <laughs> so so okay so so here's the here's the situation I let's assume that that there's someone listening in fact right now who who may have gotten we'll call it their second win they're like you know what i'm gonna do this thing i'm gonna become an entrepreneur they are standing in front of what i would like to call the superhero outfit store they're gonna make it happen angela and that that's where they are and they're at what i like to call the precipice of decision and you know like i know that when we reach these moments what ends up happening is that we have a companion and that companion often comes in the form of a voice and it's a voice that often says things like, don't you know what happened last time? And oh my God, you're going to do what? Are you sure? Why don't you just quit now and save yourself the time, trouble, effort, and money? And for some people, they're related to that voice. So my question to you is as follows. This time, however, they're going to follow through and they're going to follow through within the next 24 to 48 hours. They're going to do exactly what you say. So what would you suggest that they do? Look for a small win. You know, when you think about grit, it's it's perseverance over decades. And you might think like, oh, all I should be doing is thinking about like the long game, right? But if you look at paragons of grit, what they do actually is they organize their life. So there are daily, hourly, small wins. Don't try to bite off everything, uh, you know, all at once do something in the next 24 hours that you're pretty confident you could do. And maybe it's like a micro step in the direction that you want to go. But one micro step after another, you know, that is the journey. Yes. See, that wasn't so hard. (laughs) (laughs) I got through it. I did it. That was a a small win. Indeed. indeed I feel good about myself. There it is. Oh, I, I I don't know if you've seen episodes of Dora the Explorer, but every time she is always. I have. <laughs> I did it. Did, did, did. I'm like, anyway. Exactly. Um, you like Dora. I, I definitely appreciate the work that you're doing, uh, the passion that you're clearly putting into it um, and, and that you're sharing it uh, so that others of us can actually understand, follow, raise our children in, in, in better environments and make things happen. And thank you. Uh, for taking the time to share your your knowledge, your insight, and your wisdom here with us today, ma'am, at the Cashflow Diary. Thank you, Jay. So enjoyed this conversation. It was great. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means characterlab.org. That's what it means for some of you. For others of you, it means there's a book on Amazon, Grit, The Power of Passion and Perseverance, Your next step in exercising your passion or perseverance is on that device you're listening to. Go get the book. Why? Because you know your goals are worth it. You are worth it. And most importantly, the people who are looking at you, they're worth it too. They want to see someone succeed. Might as well be you. Now is the time to go out there and make it happen because 
you only have now a clock. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time.